Hey guys, how's it going? Hope you guys are all well. I hope you guys like my hoodie. Buffalo State, represent, let's go. Um, this is a very exciting time um, because we are um, entering like the second half of the semester, not quite, but this is uh, lecture 12, unit three, and this is the last lecture in unit three. So what that means is that from lecture one all the way to 12, all of that material will be on the midterm um, coming up um, at the end of the month. So it's up to you to prepare yourself for that midterm. Um, I've been emailing a few students. Um, people want to know what how like what questions they got wrong on their first two quizzes, and I am gonna do a. Um, I'm going to do a live Zoom meeting probably sometimes, sometime next week, and I will record it too, so if you can't make the live Zoom meeting, you can watch it at a later date, um, but I will go through the, uh, the first two quizzes so you can properly study for your midterm. So in today's lecture, I'm going to focus on some more biotic interactions. Um, and I'm going to heavily focus on the kingdom of organisms that I personally study, the kingdom of fungi. Um, so we're going to look at how these fungal assemblages are changing in the Anthropocene and how, you know, the insects disappearing um, are related to a lower fungal diversity and a lower ecological functioning. Um, the last thing I'll go over is um, this wedge approach into mitigation tactics. So really exciting. Um, I'm excited for this lecture. I'm excited for the next unit where, where we're going to go over um, the different biomes and we're, we're going to get more into ecology. So I'm really excited about that. Um, so without further ado, let's get started here. So just some major themes from last lecture. Um, what are some effects of ocean acidification? What does cor uh, why does coral bleaching occur? What is an invasive species? And what are bees succumbing to? So these are things you should be able to answer. These are things that will be on the midterm. So you, you guys definitely, if you don't know the answer to these questions, um, definitely look them up and uh, watch those lectures because these are really, really important underlying themes. So some effects of ocean acidification. Again, we have the uh, inability for calcium carbonate forming shelled organisms. Um, that can't create their exoskeleton or shell, so they can't even live. They can't put on calcium carbonate because that calcium carbonate is dissolving faster than they can put on. Um, so they're, clearly they're, uh, there's some food chains um, and food webs that are, are, have been totally disrupted um, and will continue to be disrupted. Now, bleaching does not have to do with acidification. It does a little bit because these oh, these corals, they do form uh, calcium carbonate skeletons. Um, but when you hear coral bleaching, um, that has to do with the temperature of the oceans. So you have to, you know, decipher the, the minor differences between ocean acidification, which is when CO2 diffu diffuses across um, into these marine habitats and the more and more CO2 actually creates acidic conditions. Coral bleaching, however, has to do with the temperatures of the ocean. So when temperatures are too high, the, um, the symbiote of these coral, they can no longer photosynthesize and they, there's too much energy, the heat and direct sunlight are causing them to kind of misfire and there are you know some really um kind of complicated chemistry that is going on but all in all 
they release these oxidative compounds because the temperature is too warm and the sun is beating on them. And those oxidative compounds are actually toxic to their host and their host actually spits them out. So when you see a bed of coral that is super white looking, there is no more photosynthetic symbiote because the host coral has spit them out. We should know what an invasive species is. Um, a s organism that does not, um, that has not evolutionarily been in a place. So for example, um, we have many invasive species that just did not evolve here, but humans brought them over from Europe, brought them over from Asia. So they have been historically absent, but have been vectored to an area by humans usually. Um, bees are succumbing to CCD, colony collapse disorder, and I talked all about that. So you guys gotta go back to that lecture, get those details down because these are very important ideas, especially when we're talking about the Anthropocene. So here are some figures from um, last lecture. Again, CO2 diffuses freely into the oceans. Um, Without these uh, algae creating their calcium carbonates uh, like enclosure, they can't live. So they're no longer going to be able to absorb CO2 to fix into sugars. And you get less and less carbon that gets trapped in these food webs. Remember, when you see this figure, you should think of carbon sequestration but you should also think of carbon storage, right? So as we move forward, as we try to mitigate all these environmental issues, the thing that is we should, I'm trying to drill home is that it's not so much about carbon store, uh, a carbon sequestration. It's about long-term carbon storage. And in ecosystems, you get really long-lived predators that store carbon for, you know, an extremely long time. You get like 70-year-old individual great white sharks. You know, think about the whales, right? Think about how long-lived some whales are. They can live almost 200 years old. So they're storing carbon for 200 years old, 200 years, right? Um, so another thing I want us to think about is that, you know, obviously forests sequester a lot of carbon. What happens if you cut a forest down and utilize those wood products or use those, you know, use timber for just fuel and burn that wood? What happens then? So you get initial, you get this initial sequestration as the tree is absorbing CO2 and working it into their tissues. But when you cut that tree down and burn it, guess what gas is released back into the atmosphere? Carbon dioxide, right? So all that sequestration was for nothing. Now, if you do make wood furniture, for example, that stands the test of time, this uh, dresser behind me over here, the wood floors that are treated, right? That is, you know, that is um, storing carbon for a much longer time, right? Even though the wood, what, you know, the tree trees were cut down to make these things, um, that carbon is being stored. So think about that. Um, it's not so much about carbon sequestration because storage is just as important. So moving into some new material, um, I touched upon this a few times already. Um, we focused on bees last lecture, um, but bees aren't the only important insects. Insects play integral roles in every ecosystem that they're in. Um, these, these, um, these roles include pollination, we know what pollination is, herbivory, um, detrivery, which is the, um, like basically decomposition, right? They help um, break down dead organic matter. Um, herbivory is them just eating living plant tissues, nutrient cycling, 
and they also provide food sort a food source for higher trophic levels. So things eat insects, right? So these are very important functions that insects take part in. 80% of wild plants are estimated to depend on insects for pollination, while 60% of the birds depend while 60% of birds rely on insects as a food source. So these are some rather large numbers and you can't um, ignore how important insects are. Um, just a side note, this is a scorpion. Scorpions are not insects. Um, they are chelicerates, so they are actually more ancient, if we're talking evolutionarily, um, than um, insects. So scorpions are not true insects, but I just really like this picture. You don't really see a cute little bird eating a scorpion. I mentioned this figure um, in actually unit one. So we're revisiting this figure. And Halman et al. in 2017, these German researchers in 2017, released this paper that really, really shook up the entomological world. So entomology is the study of insects. So they carried out a 30-year study. Well, nearly 30 years. Actually, a 27-year study. And that is an, a main reason why it shook up, you know, the natural world. People who understand and, and study the natural world, that's, this is why it shook, you know, us up. Um, because if it was a one-year study, you know, researchers would say, hey, it was an anomaly. It was a really dry summer in Germany, so insect biomass was, was significantly down. But this is not an anomaly. This is over almost 30 years. So a steep decline over 30 years is very alarming, right? You, you take out the factor of it just being a one-year anomaly. Um, and again, remember, when you're looking at a figure, you have to understand the axes, right? So again, the y-axis is biomass, grams, per day. And notice that it has been log transformed, right? So we have it increases at an increasing rate, right? Because you simply could not fit all of this data if it was just regularly spaced, right? We start at point one and over here is 20, right? So if each of these segments was point one, Right, this will be off of my computer screen. So they condensed it. Um, we can see it better, but it also takes away of some of the uh, a lot of the intensity to the, the average person that might not um, understand the different axis right here and how it's um, oriented. This doesn't look like it's decreasing that much, but because it is log transformed, you get. Um, you know, you get to understand how steep this actually is, right? And we obviously on the x-axis, we have the time, the time which the study started and the end date. So how do they do this? Well, they use these traps called Maylie's traps. They deployed them for 27 years across 63 natural habitats across Germany. And these 63 habitats, these um, locations represent actually different habitats. So researchers, when they set up this experiment, they couldn't just select um, deciduous or mixed forests in Germany, because then you're only going to sample the organisms that live in those specific ecosystems. So they have these traps deployed over a plethora of different ecosystems, right? So near rivers and streams, near standing bodies of water, in coniferous forests, in deciduous forests, in swamps. Um, so they wanted to get a, a better, you know, a broader 
indication of the insects in Germany, not just a specific ecosystem, but a broad scale. And these are what the Maylees traps look like. So basically insects, um, if you guys look right here, insects actually fly and hit this net here. So this actually works both ways. So insects can fly and hit this side or fly in and hit that side. And just kind of arbitrarily, insects, they usually, when they hit something, they usually climb up. So these insects, they hit this mesh kind of tent looking structure. They climb up, they keep climbing up. And here there's actually a bottle and that bottle has ethanol and they usually spray this vessel with a substance that is very slippery. So as soon as they touch that, they slip into the ethanol they are killed right there usually in just a few seconds and then you get to see how many insects per day how many grams of insect biomass per day you collect right so here are some different habitats we have this like shrubland we have this ecotone that's right next to some agricultural setting and then we have this ecotone between a grassland and a um, looks like a des deciduous forest so some cool little things there now because there's been a 75 percent reduction in insects let's now focus on some of the functions that i haven't mentioned that insects take part in so insects facilitate sapotrophs you guys should know what a sapotroph is remember it is an organism that eats um, dead organic matter so not only do insects directly break down dead organic matter but they actually transfer other organisms that specialize in a saprophytic lifestyle so here's a really cool looking beetle and in this other study, they um, analyzed how insects interact with fungi. And they found that um, quite similarly, the more insects there were, the um, better the, these woody debris became decomposed. Um, and they tied that to the insects actually spreading saprophytic fungi. So in this study, 60 aspen trees were killed on two separate landscapes and using uh, insect trapping methods, the different insect species were identified for the four following years. They quantified the different fungi growing from the dead trees after year 12. So this is another long-term study they killed these aspen, tree, aspen trees. They piled them up in two different ecosystems. They quantified the insect species that were there on year four. They came back on year 12 to quantify the different fungi growing from those trees. What they found was that, um, and before I get into the actual data in this figure here, this is a species of Ganoderma that I found in Chestnut Ridge. It was in this um, hollowed out dead log and I shined a light on it. Me and my friend Zach Kava, um, we, we found this mushroom and um, it pr this species actually produces all of these, um, this resin. So through its decomposition, it actually exudes this resin. So really really cool in this study a closely related ganoderma aplanatum um, was very um, abundant in year 12 and let's there's a lot going on this is the um, the number or the quantity of insects they they quantified 
from years one through four. All right, so we have the abundance of this insect and the probability of this fungus, this, this bracket or shelf fungus. Um, so again, there's a lot going on here. We have these dark lines. Um, these dark lines represent one ecosystem type and this red line actually represents another ecosystem type. So we have a closed forest and then an open forest. So a closed forest is gonna have usually a lot more species. Um, it has usually has been less disturbed. It's usually a little bit um, older because it takes time for a canopy to close. So an open forest is usually gonna be a younger forest and it's gonna be usually less biodiverse. Um, so I know it looks like three black lines, but really you just have this main, um, this main line and then these are kind of like the, you know, the range. So like the maximum and the minimum. But folk, and same with this red line, this middle dotted line is like the main line. And then you have like, you know, these like, it's like an error bar, right? It's like, like, uh, yeah, it's just showing kind of the range, but this is like the median of, of their data that they um, collected and, Kind of utilized. So what we can see is that as the um, abundance of this insect increases, the probability of this fungus increases, which makes a lot of sense because these beetles, they are actually living and eating and, and um, you know, carrying out their life cycles with, within these dead trees, right? And they're coming into contact with the spores of these fungus. And then when these fly to another dead tree, they're spreading their spores. So the more insects we have, right, the more fungus, saprotrophic or saprophytic fungus we see. And it makes sense that in closed forests, there, the probability of this fungus is already going to be higher, right? Because there's going to be more woody debris. There's going to be more decomposition in a closed forest because they're usually going to be older. There's just simply going to be more of these fungi. There's going to be more spores that the fungi can produce. So closed forests generally have more fungi and they generally have more insects. So it makes sense that... Uh, that this black uh, closed floor forest has more fungi um, and it's definitely going to have more decomposition. Now some ins insects don't transfer the fungi directly like this last scenario, but they actually enhance the a fungus's growth by creating a suitable habitat. So this is another picture that I found on one of my hikes. Um, this is a tiny little cup fungus by, a, uh, what is it called again? Yes, by Spirella citrina. And um, you can see that this specimen that I found, the bark has been stripped off, right? These fungi cannot grow on bark because bark has evolved to deter insects and fungi. So when um, many species of trees, they produce this bark that is really rich in tannins and tannins are really hard to digest and this deters insects from boring in them and it deters fungi from actually getting to the actual wood of the tree. So many uh, tannins are produced. You get other secondary compounds and resins. Um, all in all, bark protects trees. Some bark actually protects the tree from forest fires, right? Um, which is crazy. 
in the on the west coast you have some of these giant sequoia trees and redwoods sometimes their bark is actually over two feet thick so um, sometimes even up to a meter thick and that bark layer can actually withstand incredible temperatures so not only protection from insects and fungi but actually fire sometimes so what this study looked at is that tiny little orange cup or yellow cup fungus by Spirella citrina and this is how you spell it so i'll get this out of here and basically they did this is the same thing you have um, the general trend is of a negative slope right and you have bark cover as a function of wood boring beetles so what this means is that as the abundance of these wood boring beetles increase the bark decreases that makes a lot of sense so the more of these insects that specialize in actually penetrating through bark more and more bark just falls off so you have a, if you have a ton of these beetles that are penetrating the bark over time the bark is simply just going to fall off and again these are dead trees so you know the bark is going to fall off much easier on a dead tree than a living tree the more beetles you have that are boring through the bark the um the less bark cover you have right so now let's shift to this figure this figure has the probability of bisporella citrina right in the presence of year 12 right so the probability of this fungus after year 12 as a function of the abundance of wood boring beetles so you can see that these beetles actually remove bark and allows bisporella citrina to live its saprophytic lifestyle they are not spreading their spores they are creating a habitat for that fungus and again in a closed forest there there is more species there are more fungal spores so you're going to have a higher probability to find bisporella citrina than you are in an open forest but even still if you get enough of these wood boring beetles you're going to see this fungus cool so the bigger picture is that changing insect densities reduces fungal decomposition right and this is a huge this is a huge kind of idea of the importance of insects right there are indirect relationships that we don't normally think of yes we know that birds eat insects so if you remove insects birds are going to have to find a different food source there's going to be more competition that's a direct interaction here this is a very indirect interaction so without insects there isn't going to be habitat uh, for some of these fungi to decompose these woody structures without insects some of these fungi will not readily disperse to these woody habitats either so all in all lower insects lower decomposition rates when there's lower decomposition rates more nutrients kind of remain stagnant there is less nutrients that goes into new plant growth there is less forest regeneration and you can see these you know this kind of landslide effect as we remove insects both directly and indirectly and obviously the carbon cycle changes right so the next thing that oh man i love this lecture a lot of fungus um the next Thing I want to get into is has to do with CO2 think about the late Devonian this should be a little bit of review remember that in the late Devonian vascular plants they evolve they sequester a bunch of CO2 and change the environment 
So what we should realize is this relationship between CO2, uh, carbon sequestration in plants, and not only that, but where much of that carbon goes. Um, so another term that I've introduced in the past is the term mycorrhizae. So a mycorrhizal fungus is a fungus that interacts with plant roots and they form this really amazing mutualism. So again, I have this figure. So here is Amanita. Um, this is um, this awesome group of fungi and um, it should look a little familiar to you. It looks like the Super Mario mushroom, Amanita muscaria. And if you zoom in here, you can see that the hyphae from the fungus actually surrounds the roots of this pine tree, kind of forms like a cocoon around their roots. And the fungus sends soil nutrients like nitrogen and phosphorus. Remember, those are two of the main limiting nutrients on Earth nitrogen and phosphorus, finds those nutrients because these hyphae are really good at what they do. They're really small, really fine, can fit into all these nooks and crannies within the soil. They send those nutrients to the plant. The plant photosynthesizes, fixes sugar, and actually sends sugar to the fungus. There are two main groups of mycorrhiza. Ectomycorrhiza, like this is what you're seeing. The hyphae, it does get in the root, but it doesn't actually penetrate the cells of the plant. Whereas our buscular mycorrhizae, they do actually penetrate the cells of the plant. So two different types of mycorrhiza. So um, we should know, and there's some red terms here, right? 90% of plants are mycorrhiza have mycorrhiza, right? 90% of living plants have mycorrhiza. That is ridiculous, right? Almost every plant you see forms a really tight knit relationship with symbiotic fungi. Another thing I want us to know is that on average, 20% of a plant's uh, of the, the sugars that plants make actually is sent to their fungal symbiote, right? So imagine paying 20% of your taxes, right? 20% of your total income, let's say, right? That's ridiculous. That's so much car that's so much carbohydrates, right? That's so many carbohydrates. 20% of their sugars are sent to their fungal symbiote. This seems unrelated, but it, you're going to see in just a little bit the importance of this. The CO2 concentrations um, right now are around 415, up probably like 420 to 25 right now. So parts per million. And this is actually Amanita muscaria in our own neck of the woods. Amanita muscaria actually, ha there's a different variation that grows in the forest right around us. This is Chestnut Ridge Park, um, and this is still called Amanita muscaria, but the variation is um, Gasawi. So we have this version of Amanita muscaria over here. In several other places, you get this red cap version that inspired the Super Mario mushroom. It is psychoactive. Now, don't go out in a forest and eat mushrooms because you probably will die, right, if you don't know what you're looking for. The Amanitas have, um, within this family of mushrooms, there are um, at least two uh, of the most poisonous mushrooms known to man, right? So I want to go over some characteristics of the Amanitas. Yes, these ones are psychoactive, um, but, you know... Don't be eating mushrooms. Don't recommend it at all. Um, but do know that when Mario does get a power-up mushroom, he's not actually growing. He's just thinking that he's growing, right? Because he is essentially tripping, right? 
So don't be like Mario. Um, this is Amanita Cesare. Um, and in Italy, there is a... Um, okay, so in North America, the really closely related North American species is Amanita jacksonii. So I actually think these are Amanita jacksonii. In Europe, this is... Am, um, it's a very closely related species called Amanita cesare. And in my father's um, hometown, um, they go foraging. They used to go foraging. And he used to tell me, um, and I actually visited his hometown, and I've talked to some people that still forage. And this fungus... Um, and I just love the Amanitas, all of them, they have this protective vulva that they grow from and they kind of like hatch through the top. So anytime you see this intact vulva and another really big characteristic of the Amanitas is this veil. So this veil actually covers the gills um, in the younger specimen so the the gills will actually be protected from this veil you see the veil remnant that ripped from the gill covering um, and you always see a vulva sometimes a vulva breaks down a little bit it's harder to find or it's like buried but anyway in italy um they call this they call amanita um cesare they call it um ua uovu which means egg. I probably butchered that in Italian. Um, but they actually don't even cook it. They, they, they find these little eggs, right? And they actually shave them. They clean them and they shave them raw on a plate. And they just put olive oil and salt and pepper and then you just like eat it with bread. Um, so I thought that was cool. It does look like an egg though. And I love how you can just see this, you know, immature fruiting body. And another thing we should note is that, you know, fungi is per permeates through the landscape and a mushroom will pop up, um, but realize that there is m more than likely hyphae that is greatly surrounding that area. And the goal of a f actual mushroom is to spread spores, right? So this, the gills... Um, actually produce spores that then float away, catching air currents. And hopefully, because most Amanita are mycorrhizal, hopefully their spores will land by a suitable tree. So looking back when these mutualisms evolved, we realized that plants might have sent more sugars down to their fungal counterparts. So um, ectomycorrhizal fungi, um, they evolved during the Cretaceous with the diversification of deciduous and like flowering trees. So angiosperm means flowering. So that's when these fungi evolved. And when researchers realized that when these fungi evolved, when angiosperm trees diversified, CO2 levels were actually higher than they are now. Remember, using the proxies that we've come across, um, we can actually see the CO2 of the time. CO2 during the, that Cretaceous period was around 1,100 to 1,700 parts per million. That is much higher. Remember, we're around 400. We're not even at 450 yet. I mean, the rate at which we're increasing is higher than we've seen ever, pretty much, besides like major, major extinction events. Um, but CO2 levels were actually higher when these trees first evolved. A thing that we should realize is that the higher the CO2 concentrations are, the more efficient photosynthesis becomes. So if a tree is in a CO2 enriched environment, it's going to grow really rapidly. It's going to produce a lot of sugars. So researchers 
carried out this amazing experiment. This is one of my favorite experiments. Quark et al. in 2014, they wanted to basically emulate this Cretaceous-like atmosphere. So they took different tree species that engage in um, ectomycorrhizal and endomycorrhizal symbiotes. And their control was just growing these trees in ambient um, atmospheres. And their um, treatment was in these elevated Cretaceous atmospheres. They found out, so again, they have these growth chambers, different CO2 treatments using different tree species. Some tree species were ectomycorrhiza. Some tree species were um, AMF or arbuscular mycorrhiza. Their results were awesome. So arbuscular mycorrhiza was not altered by CO2 content. But the ectomycorrhizal fungi that evolved with these carbon-enriched atmospheres became ravenous. So the um, ectomycorrhizal fungi growing in the growth chambers that, em that emulated the, the Cretaceous period with the higher CO2 concentration had a twofold increase of mineral weathering, um, which means that they actually were exuding two times more enzymes to break down their soil. And why would they do this? Well, it turns out, and here's this figure. This is a graph from this study. We have um, the black bars are the ambient or slightly, you know, in 450 parts per million of CO2. And then the white bars are 1,500 parts per million of CO2. You can see ectomycorrhizal fungi um, actually received more sugar. So this is log carbon allocation. So how much sugar the plant is sending to their fungus, they are sending a significant more um, amount of sugar in the elevated CO2. So with more sugar as the plant is doing really good in its elevated co2 environment it's sequestering more carbon dioxide because more carbon dioxide is available to it it's creating more sugars and it's sending more sugars down to its symbiote as more sugar is sent to the fungus it can then create more enzymes to break down and find more soil nutrients so this is silicate calcium dissolution so this is like this enzymatic process that gets calcium out of the soil. So with more sugars being sent to ectomycorrhizal fungi, more enzymes, the fungus actually secretes more enzymes. Remember, fungus digests their environment externally as opposed to us actually internally digesting. So the bigger picture is, as our atmosphere becomes enriched with CO2, plants will synthesize more sugars. They'll send more sugars down to their ectomycorrhizal mutualis, and in return, the fungi will then create more enzymes, ultimately enhancing chemical weathering. So we can, by studying the past, and this is the kicker here, right? Because we, we, we went in the past, we, we looked at when um, the angiosperms evolved and when ectomycorrhizae evolved, we realized what the concentration of CO2 was at that time. We did this awesome experiment and by studying the past, we can better predict the future, right? I love this study, I love science, I love this process. Um, we know that carbon dioxide is increasing on our planet. So now with this knowledge, we know that more and more sugars are actually being pumped underground to fungi. With that, we know that in the future, there's gonna be more weathering of our soils. So soils in our forests are going to become more nutrient depleted faster as more sugar is pumped down in these soil habitats. So I love that idea, I love science. This gets me pumped up. I hope, you know, I hope that's interesting to you guys. 
Um, the last quick thing that I want to go over is it has to do with mitigation tactics. So to start mitigating all of the issues that we've talked about, it's obviously very overwhelming, but the wedge approach cuts um, these tiny little wedges of the big picture so it is easier to approach. So by breaking down this large problem of climate change into smaller bite-sized pieces, you and I can, you know, come together and actually, you know, seemingly make a difference, right? If we didn't have this wedge approach, it's, it's just too overwhelming. So I really like this wedge approach. Um, each one might start small too, and this is again the shape of the wedge, but their impact will grow over time and produce a larger wedge-like impact. So this is something what it looks like. Our book describes 14 wedges, 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 um, 14 wedges. Each represents 1 billion tons of carbon emissions avoided in 2058, right? So vehicle efficiency, less driving, building efficiency, insulation, power plant efficiency, fuel switching, carbon capture, alternate energy, protecting forests and soils. So accomplishing just half of these wedges could level off our emissions, right? So by better understanding our place on this planet and by breaking up these issues into these smaller wedges, the average everyday person can take on climate change head on. If you start now, you know, starting now is really important because of this wedge shape. It progresses and it becomes, um, you know, more effective the longer these sanctions get, you know, started. And local initiatives are everywhere. So Britain has already started to substitute natural gas for coal, promote energy efficiency in home and in, in homes and industry and raise its already high gasoline tax. Um, New Zealand has pledged that their country will be the first to be carbon neutral. Germany is leading the way. We already know this. Um, it has reduced its CO2 emissions at least 10% by switching from coal to gas and by encouraging energy efficiency throughout society. Denmark now gets 20% of its electricity from windmills. So if everybody, if you know every country looks at you know these problems and try just chipping away at each one of these wedge segments, we can do this, we can reverse and help out this planet. All right. So here are some renewables. Renewables are the way to the future. Um, this concludes lecture 12. This concludes unit three. Thank you for your attention. I hope you liked it. Um, I will catch up with you next week. You guys stay, stay cool and have a good one.